Hello, hello everyone, and welcome to what is the first of a series of recordings, or I suppose a podcast, where I'm going to go over the history of German idealism and romanticism. Uh, German idealism and romanticism are often neglected in the English-speaking world for various reasons that I don't really have time to divulge into. Uh, that said, in philosophy, the German romantics are arguably the most important group of people intellectually in the last 250 years. They dominate late modern philosophy. It's a movement that is scorned and demeaned, principally from uh, intellectuals, philosophers in the English-speaking world. We'll get into that in a little bit. It's also a movement that is beloved, but often misunderstood by those who have a certain affinity to it. It's also a movement that recently certain groups have reappropriated some ideas. They will reference certain concepts and intellectuals who were associated with uh, the German Romantic movement. Um, completely unfounded, uh, mind you, but they they do give passing reference to some of these some of these people and their concepts. Part of the problem of understanding German Romanticism is the same problem that I'm actually about to do, is that we often approach German philosophy in the late modern period as if it's isolated, like as if we can just pick up people like Hamann, Kant, Herder, Fichte, Hegel, Jacobi, Schelling, Schleiermacher, and expect to read some of them and to have it all click without knowing some detail of the precursor movements in philosophy that led to German Romanticism. Uh, it's important to remember that uh, German Romanticism has only been around for the last 250 years. It came about at the tail end of the history of philosophy. Uh, there's a 2,000 year history of philosophy before the Romantics and people like uh, Kant, people like Fichte, people like Hegel, uh, they have a comprehensive knowledge of that history of philosophy that led up to their moment in time. So it's often problematic when we simply start picking up, say, Kant, having never read anybody before him and expect to understand what's going on in his work. Uh, for instance, Kant draws heavily from Plato and Aristotle as much as he does from St. Augustine, thanks to Augustine's influence upon Descartes, and Descartes was a major influence on Kant. Now, Kant, of course, rejects other aspects of Plato and Aristotle and Descartes, but he also takes in aspects of their thought. And likewise, if one doesn't understand the form of British empiricism that Kant and Hamann, for that matter, are criticizing, one is basically going to be lost in the rich sea of German Romantic thought, trying to piece together a puzzle, having lost uh, the first half of all the pieces that go with it. And this, of course, doesn't even take into consideration the tremendous influence that somebody like Jean-Jacques Rousseau has over the Romantic tradition. Uh, Rousseau was a tremendous influence over Kant. Uh, Tim Blanning, a historian at Cambridge or Oxford, I don't quite remember which uh, university. He wrote a very good book, The Romantic Revolution. Uh, he notes that Rousseau was viewed by the Romantics as their sort of spiritual godfather. Uh, he was the Moses of the Romantics. Uh, we're going to be skipping over Rousseau, though, so there's a lot that will be missing. Uh, we'll be missing as we go through this. Uh, the picture, though, that is starting to become clear, I hope, is you see why we in philosophy have the almost insurmountable task of really needing to know the entire Western philosophical tradition. Uh, it's not enough for somebody to simply read uh, small excerpts of Plato, Augustine, Aquinas, and Descartes, and Hobbes, and you know to claim that you're actually interested in, in philosophy. Uh, especially at the undergraduate level, you will often go through uh, a history of, of, of ethics um, from beginning to the present. You will go through the history of metaphysics from the beginning to the present. That includes uh, the, the philosophical schools that are more theologically oriented. 
than some of the later philosophical traditions. Uh, failure to have that understanding does lead to disastrous uh, consequences uh, in understanding philosophical movements. And, you know, God forbid that you actually listen to people like Sam Harris or Richard Dawkins when it comes to philosophy. They're among the people that you should avoid, especially if they have anything to say about, uh, say, Christian or Islamic philosophy. You should avoid them like the plague. Uh, nevertheless, we will embark on understanding this important movement in Western history, the German Romantic movement, uh, what its principal thoughts are, and ultimately what its long-standing contributions are, as, as well as were. Uh, the German Romantic tradition helps to give rise to the entire umbrella that we call today uh, continental philosophy, which stands in distinction to the analytic tradition, which developed out of British empiricism. So, of course, uh, the analytic tradition tends to dominate uh, the English-speaking world, although there are plenty of bright spots in the English-speaking world that do advance uh, the continental tradition. Uh, for instance, at my undergraduate institution, uh, it just so happened that uh, four of the faculty members, small liberal arts school, had five faculty members. Four of them are trained in the continental uh, tradition. Uh, it's part of attempting to bridge the divide between the Anglosphere and the continent, between empiricism and all the various threads of continental thought, whether it be Augustinian and Thomistic, if you're looking in a more explicit uh, Christian philosophy, uh, idealism and all the sub-schools of idealistic thought, Platonic, Neoplatonic, Kantian, post-Kantian, Hegelian, as well as the non-idealistic forms of continental philosophy, think of Marxism, phenomenology, so forth. Uh, therefore, um, although I'm going to end here this recording by briefly discussing the rise of Hamann and Kant, we have to do a very quick tour of the history of philosophy uh, before Kant, if that's even possible. So we're moving back to ancient Athens, uh, this was one of the great um, dichotomies established by uh, Leo Strauss, right? Athens and Jerusalem. If you're going to have, if you're going to actually be serious about learning anything about the Western intellectual tradition, you need to know uh, the cities of Athens and Jerusalem, so to speak. You need to understand the Greek philosophical tradition, as well as how the Greek philosophical tradition gets subsumed by uh, Hebraic theology. Uh, Jerusalem, for all intents and purposes, that's principally through the rise of Christianity. Uh, if you fail to understand the relationship between Athens and Jerusalem, you will fail to understand the Western philosophical and the Western intellectual tradition. Uh, although that dichotomy, very briefly, that dichotomy of Athens and Jerusalem is much older than Leo Strauss. It goes all the way back to the second century to a early Christian church father by the name of Tertullian. He was in North Africa. Uh, he established that dichotomy when he uh, sort of polemically retorted what has Athens got to do with Jerusalem. Uh, Leo Strauss eventually picks up on that and plays with it in the, uh, in the 20th century. So Greek philosophy, uh, very briefly, uh, Greek philosophy is a, is, is a tremendous moment in the history of philosophy. It's the classical era. Everybody learns about the Greeks. But generally, Greek philosophy is broken up into, into three eras. It's the pre-Socratic era, which is dominated by the metaphysicians, the, between the monists and the pluralists. You also have people, say, like Parmenides and Heraclitus are in, are in this era. Uh, the pre-Socratic era is dominated by the question of metaphysics. And metaphysics is the first principle of existence. What are the first principles of nature? Uh, Thales is the most important of the early metaphysicians. He's the one that gives rise to the entire tradition of metaphysics. In the loosest sense possible, Thales is the father of Western philosophy as well as Western science. He uh, grew up in Ionia on the western coast of modern Turkey, and he begins by questioning uh, what the first principles of existence are, what are the first principles of nature. 
he eventually gives rise to the monistic tradition in metaphysics, which is the belief that all existence can be reduced to a single substance. There's a single substance to all existence. Uh, they're eventually challenged by the pluralists, people like Anaxagoras and Empedocles. They're going to argue the opposite of the monists. No, there's not a single substance that underlies existence. In fact, there, there are multiple uh, substances that underlay um, existence. But eventually that 80-year period of Greek philosophy crumbles into the Sophist era. So the Sophist era is going to be the second era of Greek philosophy. The Sophists are eventually challenged by people like Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. Uh, but the Sophists basically say, well, you know, look at the metaphysicians. They've been, debate, they've been debating among each other for a hundred years and they haven't even gotten anywhere. They haven't figured out what uh, the nature of existence is. They haven't understood. They can't understand everything. And the reason why they can't understand anything is because we ultimately can't actually know knowledge whatsoever. This is famously uh, recorded to us by um, uh, Gorgias. Gorgias, probably the most famous of the Greek, ancient Greek sophists, said that if there's knowledge, we can never know knowledge. But then he plays devil, devil's advocate. He says, even if we could know knowledge, we would never be able to communicate that knowledge with each other. So the sophist tradition basically says, you can't know anything. The only things we can know, uh, it's not in a foundationalist sense, what they mean here by knowing is the world of social construction. Uh, we can know the world of social construction because humans have, have created that. But humans have created the world of social construction. The sophists argue that the world of social construction is the world of politics. So the sophists devote themselves to the study of politics, uh, the study of how political systems work and how you, in coming to know how that political system work, can take advantage of that system. Uh, that's basically what the sophists are about, taking advantage of the political system for your own self-advancement. This is called ethical egoism. Uh, the sophists, though, uh, another group breaks off from the sophists. Uh, they're often included in the dialogues, although Plato intentionally, in my opinion, intentionally sort of conflates the two together. And these are the nihilists. Um, the nihilists take the more radical position than the sophists. Uh, the sophists admit in some way that there is truth but will never know it the, the nihilists say well well that's that's a logical contradiction uh, if there is truth you should be able to come to know it the reason why we can't know truth the nihilists argue is that because there is no truth so there is a meaningful difference there between the sophists and the nihilists as well as what the implications of their sort of background beliefs are, because the sophists ultimately say, well, you shouldn't detach yourself from society. Uh, this world of the socially constructed political is worth our time engaging with. Uh, the nihilists uh, go the route that eventually somebody like Epicurus does. Basically, you, you should just detach yourself from society, detach yourself from the realm of the political, and just, you know, go off into the countryside and just have as much sensual pleasure as you can have. It's hedonism. Just ha have as much sensual pleasure as you can have uh, when you're alive because that's, that's really all uh, that human life is capable of doing. Uh, people like uh, Socrates and Plato and Aristotle find this view very repulsive. Uh, Plato is going to argue against the sophists. Aristotle is going to argue against the sophists. All of the people that we think of in the classical Greek tradition, that so-called golden age of Greek philosophy, are all rebuking the sophists. Now, I do want to mention here, with regard to that golden age of Greek philosophy, the idea that there was a golden age in Greek philosophy is a bit of a misnomer. Uh, it's ultimately That is ultimately the view that we've inherited because, frankly, we've inherited the Christian tradition. Uh, when Christianity spreads into the Greco-Roman world, uh, 
Uh, they're looking for allies in the Greco-Roman world to advance uh, the philosophy of Logos, right? This is in uh, the very beginning in Genesis. It's also explicitly stated in uh, the first three verses of the Gospel of St. John, right? In the beginning is Logos. Logos was with God and Logos was God. Somebody like St. Augustine runs with this. In the Confessions, Book 13, as well as in his other works, especially the Genesis Ad Literum. Uh, and so when Christianity is spreading into the Greco-Roman world, they are looking for allies in their push for foundationalist, uh, foundationalist metaphysics and foundationalist epistemology. What they find are people like Plato and Aristotle, and they absolutely fall in love with Plato and Aristotle. Somebody like Justin Martyr, for instance, St. Justin Martyr in the Apologies, says that people like Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle were followers of the Logos even before the Christians emerged on the scene. They were basically followers of Christ um, before Christianity in the explicit sense emerges after uh, Jesus' death. Uh, in reality, that picture is, is much more nuanced. Uh, the Sophists continue well into the 5th and 6th century of the Common Era. It's not until the full rise of Christianity do the Sophists and the Nihilists get extinguished. Uh, the Sophists and the Nihilists do hang on after the challenges from Plato and Aristotle. But that idea of a, of a flourishing golden age of Greek philosophy is actually, it's, it's largely a myth that uh, Christianity crafted. Um, immediately after Plato, the Sophists are still around. After Aristotle, the Sophists are still around. And even if you're looking at early Christian sources, you could read people like Augustine, for instance. He's, he's arguing against the Greek Sophists in the academy uh, as well uh, in, the, in the 400s. So the Sophists were still, still around for a very long time, even though they were challenged by people like Plato, Socrates, and Aristotle. But the challenge from people like Plato, the challenge from people like Aristotle, is the challenge of foundationalism, foundationalist epistemology, foundationalist metaphysics, foundationalist ontology. That is to say, there, there has to be a foundation. We're going to call this nature. There has to be a foundation in order for us to have knowledge. So Plato's foundationalism, very briefly, it's the theory of the forms, right? So there's a form of beauty. There's a form of justice. Uh, how we can know these forms are through rational introspection, right? So Plato's a rationalist. Reason and reason alone is what leads to knowledge. Uh, the reason why this is possible for Plato is because uh, there's a small spark of divinity within us, so to speak. Socrates claim, claims that in one of the dialogues there's a small spark of divinity in humans. Uh, that is the innate ideas that we have. We have innate ideas according to Plato. These innate ideas sort of whet our appetite, so to speak. And this causes the soul, which is the rational part of the mind. That's another thing that is often confusing, especially for English-speaking students, to understand when somebody like Plato is talking about the soul, he's talking about the rational part of the mind. Uh, strictly speaking, that's going to be the same thing in Christianity. When somebody like Augustine in De Trinitate, Book 12, talks about the soul being the seat of the rational intellect, that they're speaking about the thoughtful mind. Uh, the soul is the thinking part of the mind. And so for Plato, when this soul, the thinking part of the mind, is interested in the innate ideas, you start a process of critical inquiry and you start moving towards the form. Now it's important to know that Plato's epistemology, although it's foundationalist, it necessarily demands a form of skepticism. Uh, this is the Socratic dialectic. Uh, throughout all the dialogues, uh, Socrates is usually a main character, main character, although it's not true for all the dialogues. In some of the other dialogues, um, people who are not Socrates are, are engaged in conversation. Uh, the Socratic dialectic, though, is basically when two or more parties engage in a conversation. That, that's all it is. Uh, they're engaging in a dialectical conversation over a specific topic and they're 
rationally engaging with each other and they're challenging their own beliefs. Uh, for Plato, you should be skeptical of what the sophists are saying, as well as you should ultimately be skeptical of some of your own preconceived uh, notions might be. Uh, you should seek out uh, other seemingly intelligent people and have a conversation with them and see if there's any progress uh, from that. Plato does think you will achieve progress if you meet genuinely intellectual people. and They're not the sophists, although the sophists are the people who are paraded in ancient Greek society at this time as the pinnacle of enlightenment and intellect. But Plato's foundationalism does demand a certain skepticism. You should be skeptical of what uh, the sophists are telling you, and you should be a bit skeptical of what your own uh, preconceived thoughts uh, might be, your own biases might be, and you should seek out other people and you engage in, in a conversation with them and you see if you can start to move towards an understanding of the form of justice or the form of beauty. This, of course, is only possible because we have innate ideas uh, for Plato. It's impossible to have uh, any formal knowledge, any foundational knowledge, if you don't have these innate ideas that lead you to move towards the form. For instance, Plato would basically say, look, you don't need to be a philosopher, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to know that there's an innate idea of beauty. You can take, uh, you know, you can take somebody, you know, presumably, hope, not a child though, not a child, but, you know, you can take somebody who's a bit older, you know, you take them out to say, Yellowstone National Park and you show them the beauty of Yellowstone National Park, okay, this person does not need to be a philosopher to know that what he is seeing is something beautiful because we have an innate idea of beauty. We have an innate idea of the sublime within us that lets us know that beauty exists and we have some brief, very small understanding of what that is. Now the philosopher is going to be the person who is interested in going beyond the simple innate idea. He's the one who's going to push toward uh, the form. Uh, Aristotle then is Plato's most famous student. Um, Plato though is a bit allergic to, uh, sorry, Aristotle is a bit allergic to Plato's rationalism. Uh, Aristotle says, well, if you follow Plato's strict rationalism to its logical conclusion, you might end up coming to the conclusion that like matter isn't real. That's all that's real is this idea, the innate idea and the mind. That is all that's real. In fact, uh, Christianity struggled with this in its early centuries uh, when wrestling with, with Gnosticism, with the Manichaeans. The Gnostic and the Manichaeans are essentially, uh, not only are they heretical Christians, in a certain sense they're heretical Platonists as well, but they, are, they, they run with Plato uh, to where Plato never actually intended, but you can understand why that logic is there. They eventually run with Plato and they, they, they come to the conclusion that like the, the material world is evil, the material world is bad, what is good is this world of the idea, the world of the spiritual, and so forth. Uh, Aristotle goes back to the pre-Socratic tradition of pluralist metaphysics. He goes back and he recovers the metaphysicians in his philosophy. And he calls his form of, of pluralism, he calls it hylomorphism. So hylomorphism is the unity of matter and form. It's not simply the form, which is what Plato promotes, but it is in fact, it is the unity of matter and form. This comes to us through uh, Aristotle's metaphysics, his book Metaphysics, where he explains the four causes. Now the four causes are not linear. This is very important to understand. All of Greek philosophy, Plato, Aristotle, as well as Christian philosophy, it's, it's rooted in hierarchy. It's rooted in the concept of additive epistemology, additive logic. You stack, it adds, it builds. So for Aristotle, our foundation is found ultimately in the material cause. Now the material cause is in fact the lowest form of knowledge, but it is the form of knowledge that we must come to know first because that is the building block of everything else. And so once you come to know the material cause, you can come to know the formal cause and taken together the material cause finds greater fulfillment in the formal cause.
and the material and the formal cause, that is what constitutes matter. And so once you understand the first two causes, uh, material and formal, you're able to then move into the efficient cause. And then once you understand the efficient cause, you're able to move to the very top, which is the final cause. And so the efficient cause and the final cause, uh, that is the realm of the forms, but they're integrally related to the realm of, of the material. So they're all bound together in a, sort, in, in a certain harmony with each other. But in order to reach the final cause, according to Aristotle, you have to come to have, you have to know the material cause for first, right? It's the building blocks. It, it all stacks. It stacks and it adds up. So you understand the material, then you move in to the formal, then you move into the efficient, and then once you get those down, you move into the final, and then when you reach the final cause, everything else below it, it's never destroyed. The material, the formal, and the efficient causes find their most pristine and fullest fulfillment in the final cause. Uh, that, is, that is Aristotle's epistemology, that is Aristotle's metaphysics in, the, in a nutshell. Um, but both Plato and Aristotle, they're, they're on the same team. Aristotle never thought of himself as destroying Platonic philosophy. In, in most regards, he saw himself as building. He, he saw himself as building from Plato just as much as he saw himself building uh, from Thales as well as from Anaxagoras. He's building off of the monist. He's building off the pluralist. And he's doing so in rebuttal to the sophists. So eventually, uh, uh, Christianity emerges. Uh, Christianity takes from its theology, the theology of the Logos. In the beginning is the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. Uh, what Christianity eventually uh, comes to understand that as, as meaning, especially true if you read somebody like Augustine, but it's not just Augustine, it's all the, 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 philo the Christian philosophers before Augustine, is that there is a rational ordering to the world, right? Because logos is, is reason, logos is wisdom. So wisdom is what structures and orders the world. So there's, there's a rational order to everything. Uh, wisdom created uh, the world in, in, in Christian philosophy. Uh, as it relates to us, this is where the Christians are going to rebuke Plato and Aristotle as much as they take from Plato and Aristotle. Uh, the Christian philosophers look at Plato and Aristotle and say, well, they're very close, but they didn't exactly reach uh, the fullness of their own Logos philosophy that they were promoting. And the reason for that is because people like Plato, people like Aristotle, weren't concerned with anthropology. Uh, so Christianity inaugurates a long tradition of philosophical anthropology. What, what does it mean to be human? And so Christianity eventually comes to the conclusion, drawing upon uh, Logos theology and Logos philosophy. You read it in somebody like Augustine, Book 13 of the Confession, he goes through this, his, his allegorical reading of the first chapter of Genesis, what it means for the world as well as ourselves to have been created in wisdom is that you, we, as Imago Dei, image of God, what that really means, it's not, you know, this idea that we get today from, say, social justice Christianity. It's not that there's like an intrinsic human dignity to everybody, although there is that. What the Imago Dei really means in Christian tradition is that you are made in wisdom for wisdom. As your humans have a natural capacity for reason. That is what distinguishes us from the rest of the natural world. You exist in wisdom for wisdom. So the human mind, the human soul exists for the purpose of wisdom. But you also exist in love for love. Uh, love is pluralistic, right? It demands that there, there is another party involved in love. And that once you understand that you exist in wisdom for wisdom and in love for love, you, you can actually achieve uh, happiness. Uh, people like Plato, people like Aristotle agree that the end of human existence is happiness. Uh, they think that happiness comes through uh, various different means. 
Uh, for instance, Aristotle, virtue ethics, you should be a virtuous person because you'll be happy with yourself. You'll have a content soul. Somebody like Plato, who's actually a little bit closer to Christianity in this regard, which is why uh, Christianity uh, very much extolled the virtues of Plato. Uh, Christianity came a little bit later to, uh, you know, parading uh, Aristotle, especially once you get, that doesn't really happen until you get to the medieval era, although there's plenty of Aristotle already in, say, Augustine, because Aristotle gets incorporated in Neoplatonic thought. But then there's Plato who says, you know, happiness is the product of, of wisdom. But uh, the Greeks, the Greeks don't have, in either Plato or Aristotle, they're, they're, missing, they're missing desire, they're missing eros. They're missing that important component of, of love. And so it's wisdom and love together, which is going to lead to happiness. So you can see there, there's a lot of pluralism in, in Christian philosophy. Ultimately, we're going to call Aristotle and Christianity. They're really, their epistemologies uh, are better understood as forms of empirical realism. Empirical realism as opposed to uh, the pure rationalism of Plato. Because, of course, Christianity, due to, um, due to its theology, especially what's, what's written in Genesis 1, is the material world has to be good, right? Because that's what's said at the end of Genesis. If wisdom created the world, and wisdom created the world, and it's good, that means matter. Matter has to be good. The material world has to be good, right? That's also part of the conflict with uh, the Manichaeans and the Gnostics, who, who implicitly or explicitly say that the material world is evil. That's a problem. Uh, what does divine providence, very briefly, since we're on the topic, what does that mean? Uh, it does not mean that God is sort of the puppet maker, uh, you know, the, puppet, the puppeteer uh, running all the strings of the world. It's not occasionalism. Uh, what divine providence simply means in the Christian tradition is that since wisdom creates the world and that there's a rational order, to, to, to nature, everything that exists has an end, right? So that, that's all divine providence really means. You, everything exists for a particular end, okay? Everything has a telos because everything has a nature. You need to have a nature in order to have an end. You need to have a nature in order for us to have any sort of foundational knowledge. And so our end, humans, um, you know, the Christian philosophers, will, they will go on, somebody like uh, St. Francis of Assisi will go on, you know, he'll explain, you know, what are the ends of, the, you know, the non-human, the non-human world. But our end is, 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 is happiness through love and wisdom. Uh, through love and wisdom, uh, happiness is, is our end. Uh, and so Christianity essentially, through its integration of Platonic, Neoplatonic, and Aristotelian philosophy, uh, codifies this philosophy of the Logos. Uh, the philosophy of the Logos is also about communicative truth, right? Communicative truth is an another, that's another important aspect of what Christianity, Christian philosophy achieves, this idea that we can speak the truth, right? That's, that's another part of what the Logos means in Christianity. We, not only can we know the truth as individuals, we can speak the truth to other people. Uh, eventually, th this is the dominant. Uh, this is the dominant form of Western philosophy for for over a thousand years, and eventually, it's going to be challenged. Uh, this tradition of rational foundationalism, if we're strictly speaking of of the Platonists, or this idea of empirical foundationalism, which is not empiricist in the way that most people will think of empirical, uh, empirical philosophy or empiricism, because we think of it in the post-Baconian sense, uh, rather than in the, the Aristotelian or the Augustinian sense. Uh, empirical realism or rational realism per Plato, uh, this is eventually challenged. Uh, it's challenged in modern philosophy. It's challenged by people like uh, Francis Bacon. It's challenged by people like uh, Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, Benedict Spinoza, uh, all the people who are the godfathers of, of classical liberalism. The modern philosophical tradition is rooted in philosophical liberalism. 
uh, it is challenged by them. Uh, in many ways, uh, the liberal tradition returns us back to, to sophistry. It's a return to the idea of the social contract. It's a return to the idea of conventionalism. And the reason why this has to happen, according to Bacon and Hobbes, is because of what the advances in, in science are telling us, right? We're, we now live in a mechanistic, right, a mechanistic, deterministic world. Uh, there, can, there can be no more free will, there can be no more logos, uh, as the, the Greeks and the Christians understood it, right? And so what Hobbes famously says in, in Leviathan is, you know, we're nothing more than a mass, a ball of matter in motion, right? If you strip away everything, right, we're nothing more than matter in motion. Uh, that's the same for trees. That's the same for rabbits. That's the same for everything in nature, right? Because the British empiricists, except for, for Locke, because Locke, Locke is an oddball, because Locke's really a dualist, but everybody else, everybody else in the British empirical tradition are monists, right? Monism, single source, single substance. Ultimately, this leads to the destruction of, of nature. It leads to the destruction of human nature. Uh, Locke runs with this, with his idea of the tabula rasa, right? The tabula rasa. We don't have any innate ideas anymore. So what it is, is all of our ideas are socially constructed. Everything is social construction, once again. And ultimately, per Hobbes, uh, Hobbes produces a, a reductionist form of empiricism. It's reduce everything to matter and motion. So, so what is a tree? Well, a tree really doesn't exist because a tree is just, a, is just matter bouncing off of each other, atoms bouncing off of each other in a certain way that give the impression of a tree. Uh, when matter bounces off of each other in a slightly different way, that gives us the perception of a cat. When matter bounces off each other in a particular way, out pops a human. Uh, so there really is no dis a distinction between humans and the rest of nature. There isn't any, even any distinction within human nature. Uh, this is why, for instance, uh, many philosophers would say it's the empirical tradition that leads to uh, this rejection of, of biology. And we're, we're seeing this, this today. There's, there's really no such thing as male or female uh, because those are loaded with preconceived ideas, right? And, and Hobbes says, you know, if we're all just matter in motion, that means what we call a male is just matter in motion. What we call a female is just matter in motion. So everything's just matter in motion. We can, we, we can reduce everything to just that. And then along comes Hume. Uh, Hume takes Hobbes and Locke and decides to play a thought experiment uh, with Hobbes and Locke. And he basically, Hume, Hume is the one that takes empiricism to its, its ultimate logical conclusion, right? You strip away everything and what are you left with? You're left with nothing. You don't exist. I don't exist, right? It's rejection of Descartes, the cogito ergo sum. Descartes wrestling with the same problem, but Descartes a rationalist. Descartes comes to the conclusion, as he famously says, I think, therefore I am. Hume says that's not true. Uh, Hume says that's not true because empiricism, empiricism is the proper, is the proper epistemology. And what you get with empiricism when you run with it to its logical conclusion is you reduce everything to literal nothingness. There's, there's absolute, the chair doesn't exist, the trees don't exist, we don't exist. Hume doesn't like this. I mean, who would? Uh, Hume understands that this is a form of epistemological nihilism. So epistemological nihilism is sitting at the bed of empiricist philosophy. Uh, by empiricist philosophy, again, this is not the empirical realism of, of, of Aristotle or the Catholic tradition, this is, this is the post-Baconian, uh, the post-Hobbesian uh, form of empiricism. And Hume comes to the conclusion that, well, 
Well, this would be this would be really bad if this is what we ultimately uh, go go down to. If we if we embrace this road of reductionist empiricism, we'll be left with nothing more than nihilism. So what Hume ultimately decides is, you know, we, 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 have to, we have to fight against that. We have to reject the urge to reduce everything to matter and motion. Uh, and so this is a confusing topic because, this is, because Hume talks about faith here. And, and faith is a loaded word because we often think of it in theological terms. Faith is, in philosophy, faith, faith is an axiomatic foundation, right? It's just, it's just an axiom. You have to take it on a token of faith. Uh, for, uh, science, Hume reminds us, is, is actually grounded in faith. Uh, we, just, we take on a principle of faith that uh, our scientific theories are universally valid. We have no way of validating this completely. It, that's impossible. But uh, as we go through experimentation, we can see, for instance, okay, this, this seems to be true, it's observable, it repeats itself. We don't know if it would repeat itself, say, on Jupiter, but we're, we just have to assume that it would. And so that's how we have a basic form of knowledge. So we have to have an axiom, uh, an axiom of faith, in order to have knowledge in, ep in, in epistemological empiricism. And this is how you avoid the reductionism that Hume, in his, thought ex in his thought experiments, runs with and says, well, if you follow that, you reduce everything to nothing. Okay, so this, this is the short history of philosophy that gets us to the German idealists and the German romantics. It gets us to people like Johann Hamann, as well as Immanuel Kant, right? And so very briefly before I end with Kant, we need to plug Johann Hamann, who is one of the most important philosophers that nobody's ever heard of. Uh, many of the German romantics are very important. Most people don't know who they are. If they do, uh, they certainly haven't read them. And it's also a, a problem of, of language and translation. A lot of the German texts are in German, so if you don't have a knowledge of German, it's hard to read them because then you're left with only the English, the English translations. And, and while somebody like um, Kant and Hegel have been translated, uh, other people like Hamann as well as Fichte, uh, only small amounts of their works have been translated. So uh, Hamann says, in essence, that what empiricism does is that it, it enslaves rationality and it focuses simply on what Aristotle called the material cause. And that's it. That's all, that's all we can know. And Hamann finds this to be problematic. So Hamann is attempting to liberate reason from the chains of strict materialism. Hamann wants to get reason back to the transcendent, back to the idea of innate ideas. Hamann calls this the higher reason. Uh, this is in the German, it's Heuer als Erle Vernuft, right? That which is higher than reason. Uh, but the problem with Hamann is that he never establishes a systematic metaphysics. And so this leads him to basically being a sort of cryptic sage. He gives great one-liners and everything, and he, he's quite remarkable if you know the German and you can read him in the German, although some has been uh, translated into the English. But Hamann is not an irrationalist. Uh, after World War II, what happens is a lot of English-speaking philosophers, people like Karl Popper, for instance, a lot of the English liberal philosophers attempt to demonize the German romantics and the German idealists as, as being just irrationalists. They promote unfettered passion and we saw what the end result of their philosophy was, right? It exhausts itself into uh, fascism and World War II. Uh, that, is a, that is a very, I mean that's just wrong on so many levels, but that is, that is what most English-speaking people think uh, about the German Romantics, but uh, to, quote, to quote Hamann here, he says, quote, reason is language, or logos, right, end quote. So Hamann is attempting to resurrect 
the philosophy of Logos. He's attempting to resurrect the philosophy of reason because he understands, and this is true if you look at the history of, of philosophy, of, of epistemology, the philosophies of Logos, the philosophies of reason, the philosophies of rationalism are dependent upon the transcendent. If you get rid of the transcendent, if you get rid of innate ideas, you lose the idea of the Logos. You lose the idea of reason. And that's exactly what the empiricists have done. And so Haman is trying to liberate reason to get it back to a focus on the other three causes, if we, if we want to look at it from an Aristotelian perspective, to get reason to be able to move back and to understand the formal, efficient, and final causes. Because that would be a movement back to the transcendent. It would be an understanding of innate ideas, once again. It would be a rebuttal to the notion of Locke's tabula rasa. It would be a rejection of the blank slate. It would be a rejection of social contract philosophy, not only in politics, but also in terms of epistemology. Uh, so that's what, that is what ultimately Haman is trying to accomplish. Uh, unfortunately, Haman never systematized his metaphysics or his epistemology. And so that is what leads us to Immanuel Kant. So Kant, he's a late bloomer, and Kant has a, has a contested legacy. He has a contested legacy in the history of philosophy. Most people will know Kant through ethics, and Kant's a very important ethicist. Um, but my opinion, uh, Kantian ethics is not as important as Kantian metaphysics. Kant's views of metaphysics is what students should really understand if they're ever going to learn anything about Kant. It shouldn't be, it should not be his deontological ethics. It should be his metaphysics. It should be his form of transcendental realism. Kant's a late bloomer. He doesn't become famous until his late 50s. For over a decade, he basically meditates on Hume. He meditates on the British empiricist for tradition for over a decade. And after meditating on British empiricism for over a decade, as well as meditating on the rest of the history of philosophy, he publishes the Critique of Pure Reason. Uh, now, very briefly on that name, the Critique of Pure Reason, uh, for somebody who doesn't know the history of philosophy, you would think, well, okay, yeah, I get why people claim that the German idealists and the German romantics are, are anti-rational and that they're they're, that, and that they're, they, they promote the philosophies of irrationalism. It's right in Kant's book, Critique of Pure Reason. That is because Kant's a, he, he is a transcendental realist. Uh, we'll get into that into, in the second recording, in the second lecture. I'll explain Kant's uh, transcendental realism. But Kant ultimately thinks that if you go with pure reason, if you go with the pure platonic model, you end up reaching the same conclusion that Aristotle does, that you reject the world. Kant thinks that's, that's wrong, that's, that's problematic. At the same time, if you embrace the strict empiricist epistemologies that are coming out of Britain, as well as uh, the French materialist philosophical tradition, uh, the French materialists are the disciples of the British empiricists, they just move it in an even more radical direction, uh, then you're left with nihilism. Uh, that's Kant's ultimate conclusion. And that's not just his own thoughts. He gets that from Hume. Uh, so the empirical tradition, according to Kant, moves in either two directions. You either go the route of the French materialists, you know, people like uh, Lemaitre, Diderot, and the Holbach, and the end result is you get a nihilism that just simply wants to tear down everything, right? It's a, it's a destructive nihilism that wants to tear down everything that is concrete about the world because it's, they're simply following the reductionist logic. You follow the reductionist logic, there's nothing there, you tear it all down. You start over, essentially, if you can't even start over. Kant's going to disagree that you can start over because everything is a process of organic vitalism. So that is the radical form of materialism that comes out of empiricism, according to Kant. Alternatively, uh, it's another form of nihilism, but it's a more benign form of nihilism. Uh, this is essentially what Hume and Locke are advocating for. Uh, 
because they understand if you go the reductionist route, you lose everything. Uh, the British don't want that, uh, or at least certain British empiricists don't want that. And so Locke concludes, well, if you take the position that Locke and that Hume are taking, you're still left with a nihilism. It's not the destructive nihilism of the French materialists. Instead, it is, it is an empty nihilism. It's the, it's the hollow man, right? It's the, it's the hollow men that T.S. Eliot speak of, right? It's the hollowness of society. It's the hollowness of art. It's the hollowness of philosophy. Yeah, there are things there, but once you penetrate into it, you realize it's an empty soul. It's an empty soul. There's nothing there. It's just an, it's another form of nihilism in essence. Um, you know, Nietzsche is, is also great on this point because Nietzsche understands that this, this is the logic of, of, of British empiricism is you, you, you move down two, for, two roads of nihilism. One is that benign sort of empty nihilism where, yeah, there's people, there's society, but there's no substance there. Uh, this is essentially, you know, the later romantics are going to say this is essentially what capitalism is. Alternatively, you move into the route that the French materialists are taking, right? The more radical, reduce everything uh, form of materialism. And then you end up with just a form of, of you, you end up destroying everything. It's, it's a new form of iconoclasm. And so this is what Kant ultimately uh, reaches his conclusion is that after meditating on British empiricism for over a decade, it's Hume and Locke. Hume and Locke are insufficient because the logic is either in one direction or the other direction. You can't really avoid the power of logic. So you're either going to go into the reductionist route and have a reductionist form of nihilism, or you're going to have the, the, the hollow nihilism of, yeah, there are still things that exist. Uh, we can see structure, but there's really, there's no substance inside. There's no passion inside. And so that is the world of philosophy that gets us to Kant. And ultimately, that is what Kant responds to in the critique of pure reason. So when we return, uh, we'll analyze aspects of the critique of pure reason. Uh, I'll principally be looking at uh, the phenomenon of the synthetic a priori in Kant because the synthetic a priori is very important uh, for the emergence of what is the proper uh, German idealist and the German romantic traditions. Uh, the true father of German idealism is a gentleman by the name of Johann Gottlieb Fichte. And Fichte runs with Kant's synthetic a priori at every level of his philosophy. He runs with it in ethics. He runs with it in political philosophy, in his work, uh, Der Geschlossene Handelsstaat, uh, which is roughly translated, you can roughly translate that as the, um, the closed uh, economic state. Uh, that's, that's a rough translation. It doesn't translate well into the English, which is probably why it's never been translated in English. It's only, you can only read it in German. But uh, the entire German idealist and the German romantic traditions hinge upon the, uh, the re-embrace of a certain form of rational Logos philosophy in Kant's critique of pure reason, and that is the synthetic a priori.